Thank you, Anand, very much for reading. May I lead us in prayer, and then we will be looking at these few verses. So let's pray together. Paul writes, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel. We thank you, our Father in heaven, for preserving this glorious gospel for us so that we can consider it today, and we ask that you would strengthen us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject this morning is the character of God. How can God be right when he knows that I am wrong and yet says that I'm right? And the issue primarily has to do with justice and the character of God, though the application has to do with confidence. And I would like us to see this morning that we can be fully confident that what God has done in the Christian gospel, he has done in a right way that stands above any reproach. Therefore, we can be proud in God, we can boast in God even, and this confidence in the perfect work of God can give way to a real confidence in our own personal standing before God. Because what God has done for us, he has done rightly, justly, purely, perfectly. There's been no sleight of hand. God is not calling what is bad good. Nothing has been swept under the carpet. There are no deleted emails. There is no hidden tape. There is no legal fudge. There can be no belated challenge. Instead, what God has done in the Christian gospel has been done in accordance with his law. He's always planned it. And what God has done in the Christian gospel has been done apart from his law. We don't have to earn it. And what God has done in his gospel has been done in and through Jesus Christ. We can come to him for it. And what God has done in the Christian gospel, he has done for you, he's done for me, he's been made available to the whole world. We simply have to trust Jesus to gain it. Now you can see that that is the issue and that is the substance of what we're looking at today from verse 21 and 22. So if you turn back a page to page 1133, you'll find an outline for our talk on the back of your notice sheet. You may well find it helpful to take notes. I hope you're in the habit of taking notes on a Sunday. It'll help you to meditate on what we've learned through the week. And you may well decide you want to listen to this talk again during the week. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God that of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. Now the opening two words of that sentence have been described by some as the most important two words in the whole of the Bible. But now. And if you've been with us over the previous weeks, you will know that from chapter 1 verse 18, Paul has held the whole world in front of him as he's considered God's final courtroom. The evidence has been produced and last week we saw the concluding summon, summoning up, if you like, by the courtroom judge 
And there it was in verse 10, those first six words of the indented paragraph, none is righteous, no, not one. And then chapter 3, verse 19, let every mouth be stopped. And so Paul's evidence has it that the pagan secularist without the law of God is guilty, chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, and that the educated sophisticate who has looked down their noses at the moral poverty of the pagan secularist is guilty, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, and that the religious elite with their performance and pedigree and rules and rights are guilty, chapter 2, verse 12 to 29, so that the whole world stands before God, rightly facing his wrath, because every single one of us is guilty. We're studying these passages in many of our small group Bible studies, and in the Bible study group that I was leading, I asked the group at the start of one of the sessions, what do you think the greatest problem is facing the world today? Brexit, said one. The inability to trust people's word in the city any longer, said another. Various environmental, medical, and educational issues were raised, and then somebody said, well, there'll be just one of two answers, either Donald or Hillary. But as we worked our way through this passage, we realized that the greatest problem facing every single individual in the city today is the wrath of God. No one is righteous. No, not one. And so verse 21, but now rings out like a glorious blast of fresh air. And that leaves us asking, well, how can God be right? When he knows that I'm wrong, here I stand, a convicted, guilty man, to suggest that somehow that I am in the right. And of course, it really matters. I mean, the last couple of days, the papers have been filled with the trustworthiness and the ability to trust the judiciary. And given that God is both the legislative and the judicial body, if we find that his justice cannot be trusted, both executive and legislative, then the whole thing collapses. How can he be right? to say that I'm right when we know that I'm wrong. Now what Paul does in these verses is to spell out in the clearest terms in three simple steps what it is that God has done to enable you and me to step free from the courtroom and from under his judgment with no debt to pay. Because it's so important, I'm simply going to take us through the three steps. Step one, step two, step three. Step one. Verse 21. Sorry, verse 22. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Now, to justify is to declare to be right. The word is actually the verbal form of the word righteous. It is, could be translated to be righteous, and therefore you could render this verse, verse 24, we are righteous by his grace as a gift. And the word justify or righteous is taken from the courtroom, and if you've ever stood outside a courtroom and seen somebody walking out free of all charges, Justice, relief, you will have a sense of the meaning. On teenage camps, the word justify has been declared uh, to be just as if I'd never sinned. It's not quite right, that. Justification is not quite the same as a simple pardon. It's more than forgiveness, though it includes both. Pardon and justification are essentially distinct, says one great theologian. 
pardon is the remission of punishment, justification is the declaration that no grounds for inflicting the punishment exist. The person is righteous. And grace is the free gift of something I don't deserve. And so one, tr one NIV translation puts it, we are justified freely by grace. Here then is the verdict of the final day being pronounced over you or me. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. It is done so freely. There is nothing to pay. I can walk free from the courtroom knowing that I am in the right with God with nothing to pay. It is done so for guilty people. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I know that I'm guilty, but what has God has done, he has done in such a way that though I am guilty, I can walk free from the courtroom with nothing to pay declared to be right. It is done so in Jesus Christ. Through faith in Jesus Christ, for all who believe, there is no distinction. All of all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Have you ever been in court? Have you ever faced the prospect of a guilty verdict? You imagine the sense of relief and joy. Well, how can God do this? This takes us to step two, which you will find described at the end of verse 24. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus. Now, redemption is another big Bible word. It's also a city word for trading. Uh, in our city Bible study, I asked the group whether they knew what redemption was, and immediately somebody says, yes, you redeem a bond. Quite how you do it. I always get in a muddle as to how it happens, and it, hearing his description, I felt that he possibly was in something of a muddle as well. So that didn't help a lot, and then somebody else popped up and said, well, you redeem a loan from a pawnbroker. So you take your gold watch in need of money to the pawnbroker. This is not a gold watch, it's a Swatch watch. It costs me 20 pounds from Gatwick Airport, and it does just the same as a gold watch, and I recommend it highly. Imagine. You take your gold watch to the pawnbroker, you need a loan, you leave him your watch. He gives you 5,000 pounds or whatever absurd amount of money you paid for your watch, which is exactly the same as mine, which cost 20 quid from Gatwick Airport. You give it to them, he gives you 5,000 pounds on the basis of a degree of interest, and if you want your watch back, you take the 5,000 pounds plus the interest, and you, have your, you redeem it. If you read the Bible commentators, they will always suggest that redemption comes from the realm of first century slavery. A slave in the slave market. How could such a person achieve their freedom? By redemption, the payment of a price. But again, this is not quite adequate. Because redemption is also a Bible word, and if we're going to understand it properly, in its biblical context, we must understand it according to its biblical meaning. Here is a key principle of understanding the Bible. Bible words have Bible meanings. And if you just go out to the world of redeeming a bond, or redeeming your watch, or redeeming a slave, you will always marginally miss the meaning, the true meaning of redemption. In the Bible... The idea of redemption comes from the book of Exodus, where Israel is redeemed from under Pharaoh's rule as God's angel of wrath comes in judgment on Egypt, and as God frees his people from under the Egyptian powers through the payment of a redemption price, a sacrifice, a lamb that enables his wrath to be expressed 
and his people to step free from under the Egyptian oppression. Redemption, then, speaks of a price being paid to liberate a people from the bondage of enemy rule from under the judgment of God. Incidentally, that means that redemption in the Bible always has far more than simply to do with liberation. You will often hear people speak of redemption as if it's just to do with liberation. It's more than that. It's liberty from the grip of sin. Liberty from the penalty and power of sin. Liberty from being under the law of God that demands that a punishment be paid. And that is precisely the sense in which Paul is using it here. The redemption is in Christ Jesus. The redemption is from being under the realm of sin and judgment and condemnation. And the redemption is being from being under the demands of the law. And so says Paul, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we are justified by his grace as a gift through the liberation from being under the law of sin and the law of the law and of death. We've been liberated. It's as if there's a prison break that's happened. The front gates have been thrown open. All the cell doors have been unlocked. And convicted prisoners are able to walk free because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. <laughs> but we still haven't answered the question. How can God be right if he knows that I'm wrong and I'm rightly convicted I'm, and I'm in prison with the doors rightly locked behind me? How can God be right if he knows that I am wrong and yet he still calls me Right. I, one, one member of one of the Bible studies in, I'm in at the moment is a top QC. And he's investigating the Christian faith. And in one of the studies we were leading, somebody in the group didn't quite follow one part and the other. And he said, oh, there's a bit of a disconnect here. There's a bit of a disconnect here. And there must have been a disconnect with Paul's original readers. And the QC chipped in, as QCs do. And he said, well, actually, there's a disconnect in this room. And, you know, I'm not used to Bible studies quite running like that, so it gave me a bit of a shock. There's a disconnect in this room, but QCs are like that, aren't they? And I said, well, what is the disconnect? Well, I deal in the law all the time. How can it be right that God can allow a person who's a convicted, guilty person to step free from the courtroom? That, that would never work. Step three. Well, let's read it from verse 23, and we'll get the logic. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, that is declared right, by his grace freely as a gift through the redemption, that is the liberation, that is in Christ Jesus, step three, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Ha. Right. What then is a propitiation? It comes from the Jewish Day of Atonement. It comes from the temple. It is translated elsewhere as to make atonement, which we saw in our first reading. Again, in the youth group, it is described as at one month, which describes the result of propitiation, but not the actual workings of propitiation. God and humanity brought to one through atonement. But how does it actually work? Oh, it works through a propitiatory payment, propitiation, which is to pay satisfactorily the punishment demanded by the law so that the right offense and penalty of the lawmaker is expressed fully and paid for absolutely. To pay 
satisfactorily the punishment demanded by the law so that the right offense, the law has to be offended at sin, so that the right offense and penalty of the lawmaker is both expressed and paid in full and thus justice done. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. It, it's, some people say, oh, it appeases God's wrath. That's not quite good enough. Appeasement isn't quite it. I see the Simpkins sitting here in the front row. They won't like to have attention drawn to them, but there we are. That's going to happen. Uh, Paul Simpkin, Emily has laid on one of her famous dinner parties, and uh, it's all ready, and Paul Simpkin has been a momentary uh, lapse in his normal efficiency and minute-by-minute -minute precision, and he's got delayed in the office. We don't know what by, and uh, there's a delay on the tube, and by the time he gets home, the party is in full swing. There's no Paul. The food is being ruined and all the rest of it, and quite rightly, Emily is somewhat unhappy. I've never seen Emily somewhat unhappy. and Anyway, we won't go into that, but something needs to happen for her wrath to be dealt with. And Paul produces from behind his back a big bunch of flowers, and her wrath is... Well, it's not expressed, is it? It's appeased. For justice to be done, Wrath has properly to be expressed. You know, I, I've recently become a supporter of Stoke City Football Club for reasons which uh, are personal, I can tell you afterwards, but imagine one of our strikers, I don't know any of their names, I know the, the manager is Mark Hughes, but imagine one of our strikers get mowed down in the penalty area and I'm, I'm standing there in the stands. I will want justice to be done. It's got to be a red card, otherwise the whole thing will fall to bits. Justice has to be done. The right offense of the law must properly be expressed if God is to be just and at the same time the justifier of those who are unjust. To make atonement, to propitiate, is to satisfy the demands of justice by the payment of a sufficient penalty such that the offense of the offended is expressed and at the same time paid for fully. Now look at our verse. All have sinned, verse 23, and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, we're freed, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Blood in the Bible always represents death. And so as Jesus hung on the cross, fully man and fully God, God expressed his just offense and wrath at the sins of all of humanity and his wrath was poured out upon his propitiatory sacrifice, Jesus Christ, such that the full offense of God was rightly and justly expressed at all the sins of humanity. And the full offense of God was rightly and justly experienced by humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiatory sacrifice. But how can one man make propitiation for the sins of the whole world? Oh, because this man is fully man. He is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. Oh, because this man is fully God, he is Jesus Christ, the divine Son. And so the perfect man with no sin of his own, own and the representative man who stands at the head of a whole new family and the divine man who as God is put forward by God 
such that the punishment due to be paid to God is paid for by God himself. God is the offended party, made angry at our sin. Quite rightly, we stand convicted, but God put forward a representative man, Jesus Christ, with no sin of his own, fully God, so that God himself could carry the judgment that you and I deserve. This means that my sin is not simply covered or forgotten or removed or discounted. All of those would leave us questioning, well, where's the justice in that? If just a blanket was put over your sin so that it was simply covered, where's the justice? Because the right offense of the, of the law must be expressed towards sin. And if it's just being covered over, it might reemerge later on. And you're thinking all your life, help, 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 what's going to happen when it comes to the day of judgment? Rather, the sin has been blotted out, it's been deleted, it's been erased and eradicated because the just punishment of the law has been fully expressed in the sacrifice that God put forward, perfect humanity, with no sin of his own, representing all of humanity, fully God, the punishment due to God, fully man carrying in his body, through his blood, at the cross, the payment of God's wrath at human sin, death. Ah, says somebody, is this just plan B, because God's original plan didn't quite work? No, says Paul. The law and the prophets bear witness to it, which is why we had Leviticus 16 read for us and Isaiah 53 at the start of the service. But it happens apart from the law because this is not a route by which I earn or try and put right what once was wrong through my own efforts. It is a sacrifice put forward by God himself. Ah, says somebody else, how can I access it? It sounds too good to be true. Doesn't it sound too good to be true? Through faith. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Verse 25, to be received by faith. Verse 26, to show his righteousness at the present time so that he may be the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Jesus. It happens by God's grace alone. It happens in Christ Jesus alone. It happens in, by faith alone as I simply receive what God alone has done. Somebody very brilliantly described faith as being like the swallow in its nest, the little chick that opens its mouth wide if you remember back in the summer as the swallows are buzzing in and out, feeding their young, and the chick opens its mouth to receive by faith from its parent all that its parent has labored for. Faith, as I receive. Available apart from the law. Not that I have to earn it or add to it. Available freely by grace as a gift. And as I receive this gift, all my sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for and accounted for and dealt with and covered once and for all time. They are gone. I need fear no condemnation. I need fear no charge. Nothing can separate me from God because I am in Christ Jesus and my sin has been dealt with. I can walk free from this building if I've never heard this before and the great weight of my guilt has gone forever, never to be raised again. And for some of us who find ourselves plagued 
by memories of past sins, they have been dealt with forever by Jesus on the cross. Many years ago now, I remember speaking to somebody in his mid-40s. He seemed to me as ancient as the hills uh, at that stage, but now he seems rather young. Maybe he was early 50s, something like that. And we were talking about this, that, and about the Christian faith. And he was in church every week. And he said this to me. He said, you know, William, the trouble is... I see my life as rather like a mill pond. And I know there are any number of rusty bicycles that have been thrown into the pond under the surface. And I know you can't see that, but I'm sure God does. And I find myself constantly plagued by memories of them. And I consider that the things that are going wrong in my life at the moment are a result of God knowing they're there. He'd never understood these verses. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation for our sins to be received by faith. If you come to Jesus then and receive this gift your sins are gone. God sees you as perfect you are righteous in Christ. You need fear no condemnation. No charge can be laid against you. Nothing can separate you from God. There's no disconnect because God has righteously dealt with his righteous wrath at the unrighteous in Jesus and as I trust in Jesus. I step free from the courtroom, justified. Well, we're going to sing of this twice in a moment. First in this great song written by John Edison that you'll see there. Do look at it because it's in line, it's in every verse, but particularly verse 4 captures it beautifully at the cross of Jesus. Open up your song sheet, turn to the right hand center page, look at the fourth verse. At the cross of Jesus, pardon is complete. Love and justice mingled, truth and mercy meet. Though my sins condemn me, Jesus died instead. There is full forgiveness in the blood he shed. And then John Wesley the last verse we'll sing at the end. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. But the issue isn't primarily to do with little you and little me. It's primarily to do with God. And God has righteously made possible the righteousing of the unrighteous. God has justly made possible the justification of the unjust. God is right. Even when he knows that I am wrong, to call me right as I trust in Jesus Christ. And therefore I can boast of God. I can be proud of God. There's no disconnect, no legal fudge, no deleted emails, no hidden tape, no challenge to come later. The maker of the law and the enforcer of the law is 
utterly just. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>